Thank you for the signal. Um, we dedicated this to our class for Refua Shelema. I mentioned the name now. Refua Shelema too. And to Elon Nishmat, Sek of the Soul, Chaya Sara, but it's Chak Yosef Alevi, Timon of Hatabi Gan Eden. More people wants to come, and probably it's the first time, so maybe you pay attention if someone is parking and is wondering where to go, you can help them out. Okay, uh, <coughs> we're going to start uh, today. Today we're going to talk about um, a question that I got, I think, last week, and I want to spend this Torah class <coughs> talking about that. Um, from next week, Bezat Hashem, we will start, if we don't finish it today, we're coming. We'll start talking about uh, Mashiach ben Yosef and then Mashiach ben David and maybe some a little bit about Gog uh, Let's prepare ourselves, you know? We need to prepare ourselves, right? Solomon. And Shalom Aleichem. Before that, they can sit in the living room. Shalom Aleichem. Shalom Aleichem. Shalom Aleichem. And um, before we start, I would like to answer a question. Ariela, Shalom Ariela, you asked me a question before the Shi'ur. Remind me, what was it about? Oh, all right. Okay. Baruch Atu Adonai Eloheinu Malach Olam Sheakol Nihio Midbara. Amen. The question is, you know, when someone gets Aliyah, for example, so they call him David Ben Shalom, Michael Ben Yaakov. And when we're praying for sick people, we mention the, ma- the mother's name. Okay. Um, there's a difference between Sfaradim and Ashkenazim. Ashkenazim, um, Sfaradim, mentioning except for, for Aliyah, La Torah, they mention the names of the mother. Mm-hmm. Always. Uh, to be on the safe side, you know, that this comes from the mother. And the reason we are calling the name of the father because it says, Bra Mezake Abba. Meaning that <coughs> there's the schut, merit of the child that is getting aliyah. He gives reward, he gives schut to the father. Okay, according to Ashkenazim also, why they mentioning the name of the father for a Leviah, for example, or Azkara, or the Niftar? Because it says, Lemishpechotam, Levet Avotam. So you follow the fathers. Okay, according following this Pasuk, that it has to be according to the family of their fathers, not the mothers. Okay, it's a different customs. Uh, that's it, basically. So, the Shkenazi will mention for Refua Shilema only the mother, all the rest will be the father. Okay? And in, in Aliyah La Torah, everyone is are equal. Okay. So, we were talking last week, I think I mentioned that, I don't know if it was in the class, it doesn't really matter, <coughs> about... Very interesting topic that I don't think we ever touched it. And the topic of today is shoes. 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 What shoes has to do with Judaism? <laughs> is that even important item? There's any halachot in regards to shoes? Um, can you tell me, uh, tell me what, where the word shoes is mentioned in the Tanakh. The whole Tanakh. Okay, not only the Torah. Shal na'alecha, which means? Take off your shoes. Remove your shoe. Oh, Ariela said one shoe. So shal na'alecha we have at least twice. One is plural. One is single form. One is shal na'alecha, both shoes. Once it says shal na'alcha, 
two different people, two different time. Who are these people? Why one was commended, remove your shoes, and the other one was commanded, remove your shoe. When actually they both move their shoes. But the commandment is different. That's number one. Where, where else? The marriage, the uh, Yabam, Yabam, Yabam. Yabam and Yabam, right. Yeah, Chalitza. Chalitza. The Kohanim to Kohanim goes to? The Beit HaMikdash. Okay. And so forth and so on. I want to see what uh, what shoes means in Judaism. You see some people walking barefoot. Is it okay? Is it not okay? According to Kabbalah. Does it make any difference if they walk barefoot on, 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 on the ground, on the tiles at the house, or outside on the soil? Did you ever, did you hear that there's any problem with that? Do you think? I So you're saying, Tip is saying it's a sign of avlut, of mornings. When I have to say when I grew up, we were never allowed to walk there. Lama, why? We have we all have these customs. I don't know why. You, I, I, I agree with you. Because it was only to do as Tip said when someone passes away. Some person. Okay. That's what we were told. All right. All right. We'll see. We'll, we'll examine that. What about no shoes but uh, socks? No, so it's not, it's not, no. Uh, still no good. Uh, so, no permit. In some cultures, when you go to someone's house, you take off your shoes before you go into their Japanese. house. Like Here in Dallas? No, in Japanese. Like in Indian Japanese. Indian Japanese. Or Japanese. Indian. Also Indian. <laughs> like when I, when I lived in the yoga. There's another family here in Dallas, I'm not going to mention their name, <laughs> that they have this custom. It's a new family. <laughs> oh, you have here in the community? <laughs> Is there anything anything behind it? It's dirty in the yoga institute we had to take our shoes off before we came in, not for cleanliness. Okay. What's why the Japanese are moving their shoes? In, in India. They have this uh, mat they call tatami, tatami or something like that. The reason they don't do that is because you know Japan there's a lot of uh, rain mm. rain mud, mud mm. bring it to the house so it's more like technical uh, reason some says that they in, in Japan they also uh, uh, there's a spiritual reason not to bring the outside to the inside that's what they're saying I mean so what about the, the jacket what about the person himself I don't know Maybe the shoes represent something. Yes. Well, I think you mentioned once about walking barefoot on the ground, like the soil, the, the land, something that was tuna or whatever. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, so we'll see. So. <laughs> so, b walking, walking barefoot on. A ground, someone mentioned that is going to be, it's, 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 it's a problem with the Tumah. What about people going on the beach? Or in the pool? Uh, religious people walk in their barefoot. Good, <laughs> not good. So uh, we'll try to examine that today. Just quick halachot and then we'll dive a little bit to the sources. There's many more sources about shoes in the Tanakh. Okay. In the Zohar, Hashu is also uh, compared to Klippa. Okay, very good. We'll see. What does that mean? Um, before that, before that, we have a lot of Zohar today, don't worry. <coughs> For that, there's any halachot related, Jewish laws related to shoes that Shalom can share? Something we do every morning? In Arab countries, when you take off your shoe, it's uh, like a sign. No, no, I, I don't ask question. Uh, question. Uh, halacha. Oh. There are yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, Shulchan Aruch, the second siman, I'm going to call it the second chapter, already taught about shoes. And it says there clearly the one should not walk barefoot. And if you put shoes, there's two different kinds of shoes. 
one with shoelaces and one without shoelaces. And you need to put the right first, the left second. You tie the left and then you tie the right. Okay, you start with the right and you finish with right. The right, 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 left, left, right. Why tying the shoes get precedence to the right? If I wear my shoe, the right shoe first, I should tie it first. What's the idea? So in the halacha it says in the mafarshim because in that case in tying small the left more important. Who can guess why? What do we tie on the left? The fill in. Very good. How's your lefty? Right. <laughs> okay. Um, when you take your shoes out, you take first you untie your left side shoe, untie the right, untie the left, and untie the right. That's uh, reverse. What, what if you don't have shoe, you don't have your shoe, you don't have a uh, shoelace. So you wear the right and then the left. I have another question. I, 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 my idea is not to focus on the halachot, just to give you a taste of what we're dealing with. Again. Oh, so Ayala asking a question. He's a part of the soul. Yeah. What if one touches his shoes? That's what I okay, so <coughs> let me answer that. It depends where did you touch the shoe. Okay, so if you uh, touched it at the top, you don't need to. At the bottom, when he accept, when he can uh, absorb tumah impurity, yes. If you only touch the shoelaces, no need to. Okay? If you, if you take off your shoes with your legs, this is what you have to practice with the legs, so don't touch it. If you touch the socks at the bottom, you have to wash your hands. If you touch your legs, any area that is covered or supposed to be covered, even the hand, if you touch your armpit, you have to wash your hands. Call hamekomot amechusim, all the parts that are supposed to be covered. Meaning touching my face, eh, it's no problem, but touching my hands like that over here, it needs to wash your hands. It's debatable. It's bottom line, it's from here to here. This is why you see some rabbis go all the way here to avoid that. Uh, what about messing with a new shoe? You're going to a store. And you're examining the shoe. You're touching it at the bottom. You're touching it everywhere. What about that? It's new. Well, it hasn't been worn. It's, it's new, so it's clean. You don't have to worry about it. Which means that used, something happened with them. What, what's the difference between used? Let's say used but clean. It still absorbed tumah. Mm -hmm. What tumah? Where is tumah coming from? Impurity. So. When I say wash your hands, how to wash the hands? <coughs> Which way? Run, okay. Right, left, right, left, right, left. It's not even necessary to use a natla, a cup. Just opening the faucet, washing the hands will be good enough. In this case, okay? Um, sorry? Do it outside of the bathroom? Don't have to. Don't have to. Better if you have uh, an option like that, but it doesn't, doesn't have, you don't have to. Obviously, there is um, something we will see maybe, I don't know if we have time today, but uh, any shoes okay to wear? For a Yid, for a Jew, for a man, for a woman? I Some will be not appropriate. It's not sneers. Hmm? Sandals? Sandals okay, the question is in tefillah. Hmm. Okay, so we'll see. We'll see it maybe later. But uh, it depends also where you live. You, you live in the kibbutz. Everybody walks like that. We'll get there, Bezat Hashem. So, every shoe is okay? It has to be Nike or Adidas? <laughs> Not Martins. <laughs> so, obviously, it has, it's, 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 it's a matter of tzniyas. Something that is not... Uh, shiny or screaming color, I don't know, like uh, 
Red, yellow. Some of the take other people's attention. What about ladies that has these high heels and makes a lot of noise? And I'm just telling you, food for thought. Making a lot of noise. Any, anybody, anybody, anytime she walks, everybody can hear. And have to look at and I mean, people. Is that okay? What's the solution? She loves the shoes, but it makes a lot of noise. Is there a solution for it? She loves the shoes. She goes to a wedding. And if I'm dancing my flamenco, I'm deliberately making. I can tell you, bottom line, to come to shoes, it needs to be appropriate. Obviously, it needs to be closed shoes, and in cases, uh, in places. Uh, the people walk with sandals or open sandals. Um, it will be okay for them there. To a, sh to a shul, to a synagogue, it's best to come uh, closed shoes. It's, there's even halacha for kohanim when they take off their shoes. <coughs> they're not supposed to put it in the front. They're supposed to hit it. Hit it under a table or something and then go. I don't know. If you saw people that mock on that, are you okay? Yeah, we do that. Okay, yeah, there's a reason for that. I had him extra special for him. So when they come back, they're always saying to him, where's Chaim Palaji says one should not walk on the soil directly because the soil is cursed. As it says in the book of Bereshit and Genesis, Arura Ha'adama. Right? The, the earth is cursed, so you don't want to have something that's cursed. So you have to make some separation. So you don't have the curse to attach to you. Separation can, can be in the form of any kind of shoes or socks or something like that. We understand from that that walking inside the house, it's okay. Either carpet or, or tiles or wooden floor because it separates from the... What's that I'm saying? And Chamavadia Paskin that don't you don't need to worry about a soil in the land of Israel. Because there's a kedusha in the land of Israel. So you may you may walk barefoot. Now you're going to Eretz Israel for three weeks. You can leave the shoes here, just go with a <laughs> flip flop, you know. It's not a problem in Israel. No. Um, the Talmud talks about one that doesn't uh, um, spend money to buy good shoes or those who walk without shoes. Some countries still today, 2024, they're walking barefoot, especially in Africa. Um, <coughs> Rambam didn't write anything about it, uh, any halakha, because then when he was in Egypt, most of the people walked barefoot. He didn't write anything about it. That was the Minagamakom, custom of that place. Ben Ishai says one that prevents himself from or doesn't make efforts to get shoes is Menude la Shamayim. It will be excommunicated from heaven. Mm. It's a, a disgrace to walk barefoot. Obviously, being on the beach or in the mikveh or in the pool, it's perfectly fine. Okay? Uh, in some places, highly recommended to use flip flop. Otherwise, you're going to get all the germs and then problems start. That's a different issue. But it's nothing to do with halacha. Halachically, uh, especially in the mikveh, you must have no shoes. Yeah. Well, uh, I don't know if it was Rabbi Akiva or one of the rabbis that used to put his hand under his mother's feet. Uh, and there's his mother's uh, uh, feet, so she won't go barefoot. So she, right. He did it for her when they walked together and the sandal uh, ripped, oh, okay. broken. So <coughs> she needed to go home really quickly. So he put his hand so she could walk. Mm -hmm. And that's a good point that you mentioned that she could walk on the soil. But the shoes has different uh, uh, jobs. Okay, Not only to protect from tuma, protect the leg from sharp items, mm -hmm. stones. And We're not supposed to wear leather shoes on certain times. Okay, we're going to discuss that. What's the difference? Right. And the Mishnah Brura Paskan, that it's okay to walk in the house with no shoes. Okay, so far so good. Any questions? Tough.
Let's talk a little bit about this concept. I think I mentioned that many times, that in the Torah, <coughs> there's not even one dot that is there in vain. Every word has meaning. Name of places, something, sometimes you read the Torah, you think, you know, things are random, uh, even the Targum, the translation, or the commentary of Unculus is, is the same. Divon, Ashtarot, Edrei, name of places, or names of items. Every, there is a lot of Kedusha behind each and every word. Um, Anything that comes from, I don't know, domain, an inanimate object, uh, uh, the vegetable, living creatures, shapes, buildings, all these kind of things that mentioned in the Tanakh, there is meaning behind it. From all this list, we choose today to talk a little bit about the shoes. <coughs> okay. Shoes mentioned in the Tanakh many times. We see the Torah. Make it, makes efforts to uh, give instructions how to act, to be with or without. And we need to try to understand what's the reason behind it. When is the first time the word shoes were mentioned, if you remember? Abraham, where? Taking the shoes off of the strangers? Or the, the travelers, wasn't it? Before, before. before. Abraham, 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 before. Before. <coughs> And then when, ya when Yaakov wrestled with the angel, then he... Before, I'm saying, I say Avram, Avram. was before Yaakov. <coughs> so, um, with, with Avram Avinu, we have, an issue, we have a story <coughs> about Avram Avinu fighting and defeating the four kings. On the way back, we mentioned that already, he met Sh Ma? Shem, Shem, the son of Noah. He was in Yerushalayim of the day. He came out to greet him. And before that, when on the way home, um, the king of Zdom was so appreciative and, and he was so happy that he was released from captivity. He offered Abraham, stick whatever he wants. It's yours. It belongs to you. Abraham Avinu says the following. Let me see if I have the quote here. Oh, so he says, Tell li hanefesh, the, the king of Zdom, give me the people, and all the spoil of the war, take for yourself. Tzaddik, huh? Right? I mean, if you think about it for a second, the spoil is his anyways. Right? When he become a tzaddik all of a sudden, the king of Zdom. If you uh, win in a war, the spoil is yours, right? Anyways, <coughs> Abraham Avinu says that uh, he doesn't want anything. Just those who came with him will take whatever they want. He doesn't want anything, but he didn't say, I don't want anything. He says the following words. Harimoti yadi el Hashem el elyon kone He raised his hands. He's like swearing the name of Hashem. If I'll take from a string to a, a shoelace from you. I don't take anything from you. It's not from him, by the way. But later, the king of Zion can say, it was my stuff. He took mine. You know why he's so rich? <laughs> so much gold they took from Sedom, and Abraham took it. They become rich from that. Abraham says, the one that makes me rich is only Hashem, not you. And Abraham Avinu says, "Vim ekach mikol asher lach velo tomar ani heisharti et Avraham." I'm not going to give you the pleasure to say ever that you make Avraham rich. And what you see here that Abraham Avinu mentioned the word shu naal shoelace. Not Abraham Avinu is not interested to take even a small item. He has all the rights to take everything, even the king of Sodom as a servant. Okay. 
in, in the Psukim, we don't see Hashem's response to Avram's actions. Um, but in the Midrash, we see that HaKadosh Baruch Hu responds to this scenario, to this uh, meeting, to, to Avram's decla declaration that he's not going to take anything, not a string, and not a shoelace. Uh, the Midrash says, Avraham Arab Abba Bar Mamal. Amar lo HaKadosh Baruch Hu at Amar Dve'at Sroch Na'al. So, bottom line, Avraham Avinu got the Zichut that few mitzvot will be written under his name. One of them is what you mentioned, Yevama and Chalitza. I'm going to explain that in a minute. The other one is the mitzvah of uh, tzitzit, with the string, and, and, and the talit, and, and, and tefillin, named after Abraham Avinu. Uh, they bring here a lot of uh, quotes, we're going to skip all that. Im yechud zeh mishkan, improved, uh, corresponding to the tabernacle, and so forth and so on. The mitzvah of Yevama. What's the mitzvah of Yevama? And why Shu is involved there? Does anybody have an idea what's Yevama and Chalitza? Mm -hmm. Yevama is a concept in Judaism that if two brothers are married, one brother died with no kids. What happened was, what happened is... Uh, marriage, I think they call it. Was it? Love Oh, so the mitzvah is that the mitzvah is that the brother that is still alive he will be with the widow the new widow she will get pregnant and it's one of the maybe the few places that it's promised it's going to be you don't need to do x-ray or what do you call this uh, ultrasound. ultrasound it's going to guarantee a boy <laughs> it's guaranteed a boy and more than that and it says in the Zohar that the boy is going to be the neshama of the deceased mm. come, come back and can to, to, to the world so if he disagree or she disagree, usually when he says he doesn't want to do that. Today, by the way, we don't do that. Mm -hmm. Okay? We always, we always do Halitza. Mm -hmm. Halitza, it's a process. They're meeting in the Beidin. He wears shoes and she's taking off the shoes off his leg. She's speed on the side. What's the reason she needs to take the shoe out of his leg? No? Oh. The family from his brother. And what you represent? Something stable. Right. Something that exists in this one. Okay. And this is just a symbolism, okay? He could participate in such a great mitzvah, but if he, he choose not to, so this is just a symbolism. We probably have a lot of colleagues, unfortunately, since October 7th. Yeah, fortunately. Okay. Okay, this, uh, the, the, this about that. There is another issue with Chalitza that we met in the story of uh, King David, when we get there, Bezad Hashem, we see what happens. How one tricked another guy, um, so he can kill him. Okay, Yoav tricked Avner, and uh, in, in the nutshell, what happened there? Avner came to visit David. Avner was with Shaul. We were surprised. The enemy come. He came to make peace. So, well, so David told him, you know what? Prove it to me that you're sincere. Get my wife back, Michal, the daughter of Shaul. I'm going to do that. On the way to bring Michal, Yoav came from the battle. The soldier said, you don't understand who was here. Who? Av Avner, yeah, the one that you're looking to kill. Where is he? He's not far. It was he like an hour ago? 
He was rushing to catch Avner. Now it's two tzaddikim, it's two great rabbis, scholars. So how he tricked them? He called Avner Shalom Alecha Shalom Alecha. Avner did it, thought that you know he's a messenger from David. He make, just make a peace with David. So he asks uh, Avner. Avner, I have a question for you. He said to him, you know, we are dealing now with the sugya of <coughs> Yibum and Chalitza, and we have a question. And you are a great scholar. Tell me, Gidemet Heach Holetzet. Meaning, he asked him, you know, in the process of taking the shoes off, you have to tie the shoelace, untie the shoelace, and take the shoe. Out. What if the, this woman, she can't do that because she has no hands? She has no hands. Or she is paralyzed with the hands. Gidemet means, uh, uh, yeah, no hands. So Avna says, okay, so Avna says, so I tell you, the halacha, it has, she has to do it with her teeth. She opened with her teeth, and this is how she releases. She says, wow, can you show me? She says, of course. So the moment he bent down to show him, he drew a sword, and he stabbed him in, in his chest. He killed him right on the spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, next. Midrash Tanchuma says, another reward Hashem gave to Avram Avinu because he says, Na'al Shu. He said, because you says, Na'al, I'm giving to your descendants the mitzvah of eating from Korban Pesach. But it says there, Kacha tochlu oto. This is how we're reading it on Agada Pesach, right? Motnechem chagurim, you know, ready with the pouch, with all the equipment, all the gear, and your shoes on your feet. You know, the mitzvah of eating Korban Pesach, it must be with a shoe on, shoes on. No flip flap, shoes on. And the times that we, you, you know what's special with the Korban Pesach, right? What's so special about this mitzvah? It's one of the, it's, there's two mitzvot in the whole Torah. That's one, that's one. But there is a, it's very special two mitzvot, only two mitzvot, that if you don't do, you subject to karet. Karet, karet is the worst punishment, when the neshama is cut off. No gehenna, nothing will fix it. There's obviously 36 kritot, and this is one of the 36. Which one is it? Usually, when someone commits, uh, 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 let's say, he transgresses a law from the Torah, so he will get punishment. When you get punishment, after an action. Okay? It's the only mitzvah that if you don't do, you will get such a severe punishment. The most one is you don't, you refuse to eat or participate in the process of Korban Pesach. Second is, it's also the book of Bereshit. Is it the Brit Milah. One refuses to do Brit Milah. He will, is subject to karet. The punishment is karet. Unfortunately, this generation, we have plenty of Jews that are not doing Brit Milah to their children. They're not. They said, we want to let the child choose. Oh I will not choose for him. It's his choice. <laughs> and it gets worse. There's, uh, there's foundations of people yes. that are gathering together not to do bris mila. And trying to get it. Uh, so, Korban Pesach, you have to be Manui uh, ala uh, Korban. Uh, Manui ala Korban is uh, to take share in the Korban. It means they don't have to buy a lamb. You, have to, you can participate, you can be a large group, participate in one korban, as long as they calculated that each, each person at least will eat kazait from the meat. So you can say, I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> I'm a, what's worse than a vegetarian? Is there what? A, what is it, a higher level of vegetarian? Vegan. Vegan, vegan. vegan. vegan yes. They don't even eat eggs. Or dairy. You I must think. eat it. Or there's a karet. And you eat it with matzah and maror, and you have to roast it. 
and you can't break a bone. You can't break a bone. There's a lot of a lot of laws uh, combined with this. Um. Okay. And by the way, bizchut for the merit of this two mitzvot, brit milah, and eating from korban pesach, they were uh, uh, they were reward they were rewarded with leaving Egypt. Without these two mitzvot, we were still stuck there. This is the pasuk that we says, Vayech mitboses et bedomayich, v'omar loch bedomayich hayi, v'omar bedomayich hayi. Two times we say domayim, blood, blood. The blood of the Korban, and the blood of the Brit Milah. The people of Israel were not, we didn't do Brit Milah in, uh, in, in, in Egypt. How is it possible? What about all the whole 40 years? They didn't do Brit Milah. The next time, that was the first time, and after 40 years, they did it again before entering the land of Israel. So they didn't do it for 40 years. They have people that grow, grow up, and so. So, the Mfarshim says, Shevet and Levi, the tribe of Levi, always did. Kohanim and Levi, they always did, no questions asked. Many, many of Israel did it in order to keep the emunah, the faith, the tradition. But it was not something that, you know, uh, didn't feel that it's mandatory. Hmm. During the time they were in the desert, we've learned that they were, they were concerned about Ruach Mizrachit, an eastern wind. Which means eastern is not good for the baby if they have to travel. So, therefore, they didn't do Brit Mila. They never knew when they're going to travel. Nonetheless, in one place, uh, Kadesh Barnea, they were for 19 years, right? But they didn't know when. It's like in the Israeli army, uh, but the other army, they never know where you're going. Pack up your stuff, five minutes, boom, you're walking. Where? You don't know. They'll tell you when you get there. <laughs> you don't ask questions. So they knew, so if I would do with Mila today, uh, well, I have to travel tomorrow, I put the baby in risk. So... They didn't do it, but <clears throat> some took upon themselves this responsibility, and they did it regardless. Uh, like Tzipora, for example, Tzipora did this to her uh, two boys. You want to read it? Sure. Go ahead. It was on the way in the lodging that Hashem encountered him and sought to kill him. So Tzipora took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her son and touched it to his feet. And she said, you caused my bridegroom's bloodshed. So he released him, and then she said a bridegroom's bloodshed was because of circumcision. Okay. Toda. It says in Psalms, Al Edom Ashlich Na'ali, I will throw my shoe on Edom. Who is Edom of today? Esav. Always been done. Who is Esav of today? We like Rome. to say that it's Rome. Rome, it's, it's Christianity, world, and the rest is Ishmael. Okay. Another thing is we mentioned the two mitzvot because he said the word na'al is the mitzvah of tzitzit or tchelet and the tefillin. Another one, the concept of na'al, of shoes, to be removed in a holy place. What's up with that? What's wrong with going to a holy place with you? What if I clean up my shoes? I was in Intel in, in, uh, in Israel many years ago. And there's a clean room, a special room that they build on, uh, on the air. And before you go into the room, there's special machines that cleans you. Mm. Yes, the shoes, the body, everything. Wow. And they give you a special suit. It's disposable one on yourself, on your everything covered. So even one dust won't go in and ruin the chips because mm. if dust is, is just destroyed it. so I can come you know with clean shoes I can clip with the sh <laughs> clean the shoes with the special machine and then go with it to the temple what's mm. wrong the shoes is cleaner than my, my feet what's wrong with that but we see that Kodesh Baruch Hu said to Moshe Rabbeinu Shal Na'alecha Moshe Rabbeinu Hashem told them Na'alecha in plural the place that you are standing is Kodesh. 
What's up with these shoes? What's shoes made out of leather? Leather has in it three elements, and the person himself is the medaber. What are the four elements? Medaber. Right. Under it is chai. Under it is tzomeach, vegetable. Under it is an element object. Domem. Domem. So shoe comes from a letter of a cow. Cow has all these three elements. She has, she is chai. Uh, cow is chai. Mm -hmm. It's vegetables. Right? And uh, as Mufashim says, there is no way that vegetable doesn't have within it soil. When you take it, so it's in the body. So the, in the body of that cow, there is soil, Adama, the vegetable, and the cow itself is chai. This is how we mentioned that about the tikkunim. Remember, some recarnate Gilgul and Adama. Which, uh, it could be that one will go through all these, the cow ate it, and he's there, the neshama is there. By the, by the, by the way, the neshama, according to the Zohar, feels the chewing. It feels all that. It's part of the tikkun. And it goes elevate itself for, uh, from soil, for an element, to a vegetable, to a vegetable, to a chai, and then to medaber. So, a holy place, it's like an, a special zone. If it's a regular zone, it's just an element. It's lower than the person. The person is more important. It's a higher level mm -hmm. than a regular soil. But the soil in a holy place is higher than the person itself. So you, you, you can show that you are greater. You have to take your shoes off. Okay? You don't have within you the four elements. All right? So this is why the Kohanim has to walk inside the Beit Mikdash barefoot. You know that the Kohanim, because of that, and because of eating a lot of meat, they were, uh, the Kohanim were known as people that have short views. Why? Well known. Uh, the, 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 the other brother, the Kohanim brother here, it's a different uh, <laughs> out of the equation, but yeah. most of the Kohanim are sure because of the eating a lot of meat, so it sometimes cause, uh, cause them stomach aches, or the walking barefoot make them sometimes uh, feel, you know, um, sick a little bit. And because of that, by the way, when the Kohan asks for a divorce, it, it, in percentage, they ask him for divorce more than any other, because they have this uh, hard temper, right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> so the halacha, the halacha and the Beit Din, you know, the Beit Din, they treat the Kohanim differently. <coughs> Anyone else that would come to sign in a, in a get, the get, the Edim and the ceremony, he has to sign here and finish. But with the Kohanim, <coughs> they will let them sign here and says, come tomorrow, we they're folding it and they have to sign again. Then they fold it. And they know after two, three weeks, they say, no, forget it. I'll go back and they just give up. And it happens more than once. They make him go back and forth, back and forth. So That's they why know. they never got married. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't find you. They didn't find you. Toiv, <laughs> questions? You want me to read? Okay, read. Yalla, no? Hashem saw, this is uh, Moshe, thought, uh, at the burning bush. He saw that he... Turn, Hashem saw that he, meaning Moshe, turned aside to see, and Hashem called out to him from amid the bush and said, <coughs> Moshe, Moshe, and he replied, Here I am. He said, Do not come closer to here. Remove your shoes from your feet. Shoes. In another place, say your shoe. For the place, shoes, plural, at least in English. Well, we'll have to see later why For it says the place them. upon which you stand is yes. holy ground. Holy ground. Okay. All right. No, that's okay. Yeah, yeah. With Yoshua, he says, Na'alcha. Moshe, we'll see later. Tell me, what's the reason? What's the word for shoe? Na'alcha. Na'alcha, na'al. Tell me, what's the reason we have to eat the Korban Pesach with shoes on? Here it is. In haste. You eat it in haste. So you're ready to go. Okay, what, what does that mean? Why, years later, they ate Korban Pesach with shoes on? They're already in the land of Israel. But the Mikdash is there. Na'alecha, it's plural. Yeah. It says in the Halacha, the following, the Pasuk says, it's a commandment from the Torah, okay, in the book of Shemot, 12, 11. 
It says, "Vekacha tochlu oto." There's instructions. You can't, it's not just a regular barbecue. <coughs> yes, there's some instructions. It's a great mitzvah. You mess it up, God forbid, it's karet. Yeah. We don't play games here. Kacha is how you eat it. Motnechem chagurim. You have to put your uh, I don't know your gear on. Naalechem. You have to put your shoes on, and you have to have the stick in your hand. Maklechem biyatchem. What is that showing? Right. What what is showing? You're ready to go. Ready to go where? To oh, why? When it happened the first time, it represents redemption. Cherut. And we said that Mashiach would come on Nisan. In Nisan, the month of Nisan, they were redeemed, right? Redeem, thank you. And in Nisan, the Mansan, one day, this year, Bezat Hashem, there will be redeem. Okay, now it doesn't mean that Mashiach would come that day. It could be the beginning, it could be the Shofar, it could be Eliyahu who make the announcement. Something will happen. Rambam says that we don't know what's going to happen till Mashiach comes. Anything else is speculation, and <coughs> Hashem hid it from us for a reason. It's hinted in Daniel, it's hinted in Ezekiel, in Isaiah, but we can't figure the date, the exact date. So, one second, one second. Okay. Going back to what we say on about the holy ground, the halacha says the following, Kol makom, any place that the Shekhinah is there, we cannot wear sandals. Vechen be Yeshua shal na'alecha. It also says about Yeshua shal na'alcha, I'm sorry. And also the Kohanim, they serve in the Mignash barefoot. And there's halacha, and he mentioned in the Gemara, in Brachot, Brachot Nun Daled, 62b. Velo yikanes le'ar abayit b'maklo min alo. When you enter the holy place in the month of, Echom is a no abayit. Um, we have today the the Kippah the Temple, the Mount. Temple Mount, right? We're not allowed to wear shoes when we go there because it's a holy place, and we put ourselves down compared to the holiness there. Some hold that it's also <coughs> true to Bet Knesset. So in some Bet Knesset, ancient custom, they didn't wear shoes; they left the shoes outside. Can see where the Muslim learn their uh, where they learn that from the customs. Right. Right. But you don't huh? Mama, can I say? No, no. Bring in politics into the Torah. How many friends are in the Knesset? Do you know where the most famous place in the world? That's not a holy place. We're in the Knesset. 120 to 0. What? About Congress, you know. It's, you want me to read that part about? So you shall eat at your loin skirt. No, no, we 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 beyond that. That's oh, good. We good. We good. We good. Okay. So uh, that's about that. Another halitza, and also we read just recently a blessing. Ul Asher Amar, right? Moshe Rabbeinu gave blessing to Asher, and part of the blessing he mentioned shoes, and he says, Barzel on Choshet min Alecha, Uchi Amecha Dovecha. And Kael Yeshurun, and so forth and so on. And he cried Shmuel Bisrael, and he would declare his name Bet Chalutz Anal to bless someone with shoes. I mean, they mentioned the word shoes; it, it represents stability, strength. Okay. And so forth. Okay. Any questions so far? All right. Next. <coughs> many years ago, many years ago, it was a very important persona that we all know that he was sold as a slave for a price of shoes. Oh, you mean the other guy at religious? Who was it? Yeah, Jose. Jose. How do you know that? Uh, that's part of their. He was tzaddik. The prophet says, "Al michram tzaddik ba'avur na'alaim." 
Meaning, the Ishmaelite came, they took out Yosef, he's standing there, <laughs> he wants to go to back home to his brother. He says, you can have him. How much? So they calculated, guys, we're going to have new shoes? New shoes. How much is new shoes? 20 shekels or whatever. They calculated to have enough so everybody can buy new shoes. And they sold them for very little money. They didn't want to bargain. Okay? So, in the, v, in, in, the, in the book of Amos, when the Navi described the sins of Israel, he says, three sins I will not let go. Shem says, I will not let go. One of them, Al Michram Bachesib Tzadik, Ve'evyon Ba'avur Na'alayim, for selling their brothers for the price of a shoe. Now, we know the story. You're going to read it really, really soon. Okay? In the book of Shemot. Eventually, they came to at Mitzrayim, the whole family, 70 people. It was a plan, Hashem's master plan. Yosef is there, playing games with them in the beginning, back and forth, back and forth, make them sweat a little bit. Eventually, he tells them, I am Yosef. And then, what is he doing for them? He's punishing them or he's rewarding them? Rewarding them. Giving them jobs, giving them money, food, taking care of them till the rest of their lives. Do we know that Yosef forgave them or not? No, he never actually forgave. He never said, I forgive you. He never said that. Can you show me a proof anywhere in the whole Tanakh that Yosef forgave his brothers? The answer is no. The answer is no. Rabbi Nubachia says there is no proof in the whole Tanakh that he forgave them. There's another proof that they had to come back and do the tikkun. What was the tikkun? The ten? Aseret Arugei Malchut. And the form Rabbi Yeshua, Rabbi Hananiah, Rabbi, Rabbi Akiva, all those came. <coughs> Each one in the Shema of one of the brothers in order to do tikkun, to rectify for the grave sin they did for selling their brothers. Again, the concept of shoes. Okay? Um, I don't know if it happens uh, uh, according to what I research. The, how do you call the ten Arugia Malchut? The, what do you call martyrs. them? Martyrs. The ten martyrs? Okay, so these ten martyrs was a, 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 around 45 to 50 years long. Because this, if you see the rabbis, they didn't live in the same area. But it took, it took long years till all these, uh, bro the brothers made uh, rectification. It says about that, Pamacha <coughs> one time, the Caesar, the Roman, wants to, he looks for a reason to kill Jews. I want to play it smart. So what he did, he took a house, I don't know if it was his house or a side house, and he stuck shoes on the walls, let it dry. Then he called the rabbis. And he called Rabbi, Sh uh, 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 Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel and his friends. And he told them, I uh, want to ask, ask you something about your Torah. What's, uh, what's your custom, Jews, what's your custom to do? <coughs> with someone that kidnapped someone else and um, sold them. Sold them. Okay? What was it? The, what did they respond immediately? Misa. What's that Allah says? Misa. Put to death immediately. Okay? Kidnappers, their punishment is death. And then he says, Kabalu alatzmechem din shamaim. I'm going to do to you what you did to your brother. Bajon says, What are you talking about? With my brother? What, what, what is this? He said, No, no, you are responsible for each other. And years ago, the brothers of Yosef sold Yosef, as it says, Vayim kiruit Yosef, al mecham tzadik ve'evion ba'avur na'alaim. And he opened the door and showed them all these shoes. See these shoes? This is, I'm just showing you what they bought. 
with that money. Shoes. See? This is how you treat your brother. So he was looking for, you know, reasons to kill him. And he did, he did it. And... Okay. The next thing is... You have two minutes. Nekama me'edom. Okay, a revenge from Edom. As it says in Psalms, we're saying, Al Edom Ashlich Na'ali. Kodesh Bochu eventually will punish Edom. Rabbeinu Chaya says something very interesting. It says, on, uh, in the book of Vayikra, we have a list of animals that we allow to eat. Okay? Um, by the way, I don't know if you noticed that animals that we don't eat, animals that attach themselves to the ground. Or the other one, the kosher has shoes. Shoes. They have hooves. Okay? Some other animals have shoes, but there's another reason why you don't eat them. We don't, they don't chew their cud. Alright? But all the kosher animals have shoes. They're not standing on the ground like cat, like dog, like other animals. So it says there about the chazir. Chazir, pig, pork. Chazir in Hebrew also means to bring back. Chazir, lachzor, chozer. Come from that root. Chazar. Okay? How do you find root, by the way? There's a trick to find a root for words. Halachti, achalti. What's the root for achalti? What's the root for yashavti? So there's a trick for it. Always say, Think who etmol he yesterday achalti he yesterday achal that's the root yashavnu he yesterday yashav person okay you get the idea man it's an easy way to find to find shorish Rabbeinu Bache says about those who think that some some hold that, that why it's named Chazir because he will. Yachzo, he will come, he will be back one day to be kosher. Nonetheless, he was never kosher. And the Torah cannot be changed. The Torah says that Chazir is not kosher. He showed that he has split hoofs, but he doesn't chew his own cards. So how is it possible that one day he will start to chew his own cards? Hashem will change his inside the uh, double system. Uh, so, Rabbeinu Bachya used the word, nonetheless, Orachai disagree, but uh, Rabbeinu Bachya says, Hamon Ha'am, the simple people, thinks that this is one, one day when Mashiach comes, or prior to Mashiach, the Chazir will change his uh, system. He says, no. It says the Torah hinting, Chazir, so the Gamal represents Persia, and the Chazir represents Edom, and Edom is the Roman, is Christianity. He says, one day they will be kosher. Which day? At the Messianic days, and the Mashiach is supposed to come, they will build Beit HaMikdash. Mm -hmm. Those, these people destroyed it, they will build it. And according to Mekubalim, and many other books, at the end of the days, all these big names that we know, Nebuchadnezzar, Sanherib, Pharaoh, you name it, will come back, will come back, one of, one of them could be, I don't know, like Obama. One of them, like, uh, uh, and all these names, they come back to do their tikkun. All, 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 also, those who, that destroy the, the, the this neshamot that destroyed the temple, they will come back and they will aid Israel. They will help Israel to build the Beit HaMikdash. I don't know if Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar meant that they build them themselves, but they definitely will support and protect and give you the tools and the, and the protection and everything. This is their rectification for destroying thousands of years ago uh, uh, the Beit HaMikdash. Do you think we are in that time? I think so, yes. I think so. You know, even the non-Jews, the Christians, I saw a video on YouTube that's showing how Obama looks like uh, um, an ancient uh, Egyptian. Did you see it? Very similar. He and his wife. Yeah. One to one. Look like an Egyptian... Uh, Kings, one of, uh, yeah, and they're showing other, yeah, yeah. Okay, 
Um, let's finish with that. In regards to Na'alaim, we see it many more times in the Torah when Boaz married with Ruth. So the halacha is when you buy an object, in order to acquire it, you have to lift it. If I buy from you the book, if it's here, it's not mine. If I moved it, or I took it, it becomes mine. Okay? What about heavy things like donkey, cow, so you have to pull it, right? Or what if, if it's a house? You can try pulling it. I don't know if it's a... <laughs> so it's called Kinyan Sudar or Kinyan Naal. So what do you do? You uh, lift some type of cloth, like we do in the wedding, Kinyan Sudar. Today there's a very beautiful thing made out of... Uh, Velver and it says Kenyan Suda on it. You lift it and you acquire the house by that. So many years ago they used a shoe. Again, it's an important item, shows stability. Everyone should have a shoe. You know. So in that case they wear uh, a shoe and when they did the deal they acquire it with a, a shoe. Uh, shoe also we saw when people went, they made the uh, pilgrim, no, pilgrimage, pilgrimage, right? Aliyah, Aliyah Laregel, pilgrimage. When they do Aliyah Laregel, the shoemaker, uh, they make pretty good money. Before every holiday, people <laughs> want to make sure they have comfortable shoes. Mm -hmm. So they buy a lot of shoes. And in Shira Shirim, it says, Mayafu pa'amayich bane'alim batanadiv. It mentioned in Shira Shirim, it's hinting to, it's referring to those who make Aliyah and making efforts. And buying shoes, Hashem will give you the money back. Don't worry about it. You can buy the most expensive shoes on the market. Okay, it could be Gucci, Shmucci, Versace, Versace, all these names. Okay, I will end with the last minute with a, a story, a short story about the grandson of Choni uh, HaMe'agel. You heard about Choni HaMe'agel? Choni was a tzaddik when the people was needed rain. He will make a circle, and he says to Hakadosh Baruch Hu, "Listen, Hashem, I'm not living till you give rain." And if I would do that, I would probably. <laughs> <laughs> but Choni, Hashem says, "Oh, I have to bring rain, so he gave rain." <laughs> Choni passed away, and his grandchildren used the same method. He was a great tzaddik. His name was Abba Chilkia. And in Masechet Taanit, Tractate of Taanit, in page Chav Gimel. It says about Abba Chilkia, the grandson of Choni, it was, it was a year of uh, drought, okay? And he also, when they had problems with rain, so no rain. They were sending messengers to find Abba Chilkia, the grandson of Choni Amagel. So the messengers went to his house and didn't find them. They went to the field and they saw him on the field. So he didn't speak to them because, you know, he was working for Simon when it was time. He was, uh, was afraid of Gezel. So they waited, waited, waited. On the way home, they noticed that he's walking barefoot. And when they reached to a, 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 it was a small lake there, uh, he was putting the shoes. When he comes out of the lake, he's taking off the shoes. So well, everything is uh, backwards, right? So they ask him, Rabbi, Rabbi, I want to ask you a question. Why is it? You're wearing shoes when you're not supposed to. You go to the lake. You have to take the shoes off. Hmm. So he tells them on the contrary. He says, when I walk on the field, I have eyes. I can see. I can be careful. But inside the water, I can't see anything. So this is why I'm protecting myself. And the shoes protecting. And they give them a pasu. So far, so Any questions? So you see, even shoe, we can talk for an hour plus. <laughs> in Torah, everything in the Torah. That's where he's in. I want to thank the Goldstein family for opening the house with the beautiful treats. May you have a safe trip back uh, to Eretz Israel and back home. Bezat Hashem, Hashem um, will protect you here, going there, being there, and coming back. Hashem will bless all the participants here and those who are watching us uh, in Zoom with good parnasa and good health. And I just want to remind you next week is going to be probably either in the shul or we'll see you maybe elsewhere. And we're starting a new topic about Mashiach in our series. Shavuot Tov. Shavuot Tov.